All right, you're 29 years old. You just got married. Your whole life's in front of you. You're looking forward to a bright future. You're diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. 70 days post-op, I went in for another MRI and was told I had had a grade change. They were looking and saying it looks like grade four, um, which is the worst and most aggressive form of brain cancer. It's called a glioblastoma. So that was a major shock to my system and the system of my family because it went from having potentially years of time to being told I had like six months. That is Brittany Maynard. She's going soon. Does she have freedom and liberty? I plan to be surrounded by my immediate family, which is my husband and my mother and my stepfather and my best friend, who's also a physician. Um, And probably not much more people. Um, And... I will die upstairs in my bedroom that I share with my husband, um, with my mother and my husband by my side, and pass peacefully with some music that I like in the background. I can't even tell you the amount of relief that it provides me to know that I don't have to die the way that it's been described to me that my brain tumor would take me. Do you want Sarah Palin deciding her fate? You're next with Justice is Served. We are each of us unique. Each of us gets to live our own lives, theoretically, as we choose, and there is no cookie-cutter way to handle our lives. Now, Brittany Maynard, Brittany Maynard, 29 years old, diagnosed with with advanced brain cancer. The, The doctors gave her treatment options, and she said that's even worse than death. She chose her own end, which is, you know, freedom and liberty. I personally am extremely upset with the Republican Party today because they love throwing around these concepts like freedom and liberty, but the moment they don't like the choice that you make once you use your freedom and liberty, they snatch it away from you. A woman wants to use her freedom and liberty to have an abortion or even now to use contraception because make no mistake, the Republican war on women is against contraception as well as abortion. But they want, they want to take that away. And then we say, okay, freedom and liberty. How about Brittany Maynard, a very pretty young white woman? Just put a pretty young white woman face on it, and let's see how they respond. When she says, look, I got terminal brain cancer, and there's no treatment that's going to help me. Let me die on my own terms. The, the, the Sarah Palin type say, oh, no, God, and I am the exclusive enforcer of God. I snatch away that type of freedom and liberty. It is not freedom and liberty when we have only those few limited choices handed out to us by those who claim that they believe in freedom and liberty. Freedom and liberty means options and choices. That's what freedom and liberty mean. If you and I have freedom and liberty, that means we have options and choices. And it's not freedom and liberty when we use our freedom and liberty to choose options, uh, choose choices from options and have a bunch of strangers run in and say, no, I run your life. I'm taking away the options and choices that I don't like, whether you like them or not. That's not freedom and liberty. And, And Brittany Maynard, who is about to die, In Oregon, by the way, she and her husband lived in California, right here in California, but they moved to Oregon and they had to go through all the stuff you have to go through when you move to another state, right? The new driver's license. I mean, they had to establish legal residency in Oregon in order to take advantage of Oregon's death with dignity law. And they did. They went through all of that. The cars, they did the registration with the cars. Think about all the stuff, the change of addresses. They had to prove that they really had moved to Oregon. So Brittany Maynard and her husband moved to Oregon in order to establish residency so that she could take advantage of Oregon's death with dignity law. You know, there are only five states that allow freedom and liberty on this issue. Only five out of 50 with freedom and liberty on the issue of death with dignity. Right. Oregon, Washington, uh, Montana, New Mexico and, and Vermont. So. Who gets to decide what freedom and liberty is and in what context and by what right? Now, there's a three word soundbite for you, right? Culture of life. I answer your culture of life with by what right? 
does Sarah Palin and Ted Cruz and Rick Perry and every other disreputable so-and-so get to say that they get to decide our intimate things for ourselves? Look at these are political issues. They are abortion, contraception, death with dignity. So many of these things are political issues. And if you're not involved, then somebody's going to make a decision for you that you may not like. And if that person, Sarah Palin, I don't want to hear you complaining about it when it's too late. You have your chance now to participate and make freedom and liberty the watchword for all of us. And when a person uses their freedom and liberty to to make choices from their options, I don't want to hear any belly aching about it from the peanut gallery. Sarah Palin, mind your own business. Ted Cruz, mind your own business. And that goes for marriage equality and so many other issues. These are political issues. And there's an old saying in politics, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And believe you me, Ted Cruz and Sarah Palin and Rick Perry and all these Bible-thumping idiot Republicans, they are putting you and me on the menu. one 321 one 321 6001 And then compare and contrast that with this Obamacare surcharge uh, that some restaurants are now putting on their bills. The Sarah Palin, Ted Cruz, today insane Republicans, they want to control everything And then they don't want you to get any health care, which is, like, just sick. Robert, can I say your last name on the air? Sure. Robert Mitton, M-I-T-T-O-N. Robert, who has been on our show for a bunch of times since last December when he called up to tell his story. Robert, thank you for calling in today on this issue. Sure. How are you feeling? Um, Well, I'm hanging in there. My whole I've been in kind of a holding pattern for the last few months. My heart gradient has kind of like stuck in the same place. I'm in a real uncomfortable position where I'm not quite dead yet or bedridden, but I'm having a hard time just maintaining. I'm basically just always sitting down or, or, or sleeping. I'm not doing much more than, than that. But, uh, but I'm, I'm surviving. And I'm alive, and I'm, I'm keeping comfortable enough that I'm not screaming out in and, and pain and in that kind of a situation, I'm, I'm handling it, Norm. Well, Robert, for those who are just joining us who weren't with us uh, in months past, let me just very quickly kind of reset so that we're all on the same page. Robert Mitton, M-I-T-T-O-N, and you can check him out, by the way, on our Facebook page. He's got a little place on our Facebook page, the Norman Goldman Show on Facebook. Robert called us last December, and I was talking about this issue, death with dignity, freedom and liberty, personal privacy, keep your big government hands to yourself. And Robert heard this and he called up and told us his story. And his story is that he had an artificial heart, not not artificial, somebody else, it was a cow, if I remember right, a cow's heart valve put into his heart that was failing from uh, rheumatic fever. Did I get that right, Robert? Yes, you did. Okay, so you had rheumatic fever as a kid. It attacked your heart. One of your important valves was de- was degraded. Uh, surgery around 15 years ago to put in a bovine heart valve, and the doctor said that one's not going to last forever, and it's a brutal surgery. You've got to really get in deep into the chest. Robert, you can describe it better than me, uh, but Robert said he doesn't want to go through any of this stuff, and he chose to die on his own terms, and he's been slowly kind of just waiting out the clock. Uh, uh, Robert, I guess you thought you'd be gone by now, but you're still here. Uh, yes. Um, I am every day amazed that I am still around here. I didn't think I was going to make it to summer, um, the way things had been progressing and everything. And my doctors are very surprised, too, that I am still here. Uh, and it's kind of a weird thing to outlive your diagnosis of when you maybe should be dead. And so people are kind of looking at me like, well, how come you're still around? I mean, what are you doing still being around here? And it's kind of the same situation that Warren Zewon faced when he had his, uh, you know, he was told he had three months and he ended up living almost 11. And he had to make light of that on the David Letterman show. It's like, yeah, I was supposed to be dead. I'm sorry I'm not dead yet, but it just hasn't happened yet. So, but the reason why I am calling is because of what you have brought up about the situation. You, 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 pretty much hit the nail on the head, but you didn't fully hit it on the head. She's white, she's attractive, and they're rich. 
Um, and that is how they're able to get through this situation. Um, uh, I feel very badly for, for her and for anybody that's terminal. Um, and I don't wish any malice or anything to her with that situation, but I feel upset even more so with compassionate choices now than before. Why are they always picking these perfect examples to use? White, rich, female, um, and they're helping these people out to make an example of death for dignity. Now, anybody can die with death with dignity. You don't have to be terminal or anything, so that's maybe not even a correct term to use, but we'll stick with that for right now. Um, she, I mean, they're, they're able to afford to leave California, have the money to go to Oregon, have the money to go from vacation to vacation to vacation until she dies. In this way, she is extremely lucky, uh, more so than most people here in the United States, because most people who are terminal are basically broke by the time they're terminal. They can't do anything to enjoy life. They're struggling each and every day to make it by to the next day. How are they going to pay rent? How are they going to pay their bills so they can make it to the next month? Where's the food coming from? This is the normal worry of somebody who is terminal and dying, not whether they can make it to Alaska and then make it to another place and another place and another place before they die. I mean, she's living out the life of luxury while she's dying. I don't think this is a good example for compassion and choices to be using. But like you said, they are using it so they can get the exposure to PR, to marketing. And I imagine I'm not the only one who is in a terminal situation who's kind of upset with the way that compassion of choices is dealing with this. Well, Robert, I got to tell you, I, I have some personal experience right along the lines you're talking about. I mean, my mother died three days after I turned five. Literally three days after I turned five, she was 45 years old and she died of colon cancer. And my dad was broke. I mean, my parents were very poor. We lived in a rat and roach infested hovel in Brooklyn, New York. And my dad and my mom, I mean, were dealing with her wasting away from terminal colon cancer in 1963 and 1964. And my dad was struggling to pay the rent. And my, you know, I mean, they didn't have any money. And they had three little kids. I mean, I had just turned five when she died. My two older brothers, one was a uh, 11, the other one was eight. I mean, that's, I think you're right. That is the kind of much more typical situation where a person like you is struggling. I mean, you were sent, you sent me an email. You're having trouble paying the rent. You needed to get some friends to help you out. And, um, you know, this is the much more typical uh, story. People are broke. And well, you said the magic word. So, you know, they're broke and they're dying. Absolutely. And it's a very sad situation. But, Robert, the reason, and, and you just said it, so I won't belabor the point. Com the reason Compassion and Choices, which is an organization, used her as an example, despite her and her husband's, uh, you know, very ample financial resources, is because she is a good poster child to try and bring this story to people who need to be persuaded or, or they're, on, they're on the fence, they haven't made up their mind. This presents a fake. This says, look, here's a very pretty young white woman. She could be your daughter. She could be your granddaughter. That's that's why they're using her, because they're trying to use an example, a story, an individual story that 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 reaches into people's hearts and says, look, you know, you got to be compassionate for these folks. I grant you, Robert, that this is not a typical story. She and her husband do have very ample financial resources where they can do these things. But I, I, I agree. The much more typical story is yours. But we've got a lot of persuading to do, and I choose to do it. And this is this one's all on me. I choose to do it in a political cast. I, I put a political tone on it because, to me, it's just an aspect of freedom and liberty. I mean, if I were in your position, I don't know what I would do. I might go through that brutal heart surgery again. I don't know. I'm not there, so I don't know. The, the, you had to make a choice. The actual situation confronted you head on, and you couldn't avoid it. You couldn't dodge it. Uh, I've, I've not been there. And I don't know what I would do, but whatever I would do, I want it to be my choice. I want to consult with my wife and, and my friends and, and the people I choose to talk to, my doctor. I don't want Sarah Palin or Ted Cruz or some scuzzy politician sticking their gutty, greasy nose into my business telling me what I can and cannot do and what they think God wants. I don't give a rat's rear end what they think God wants. They can go talk to God all they want. Leave me out of it. But Robert... 
I mean, we've got to persuade people so that we have more than five states where this kind of, you know, death with dignity can happen. Right. And, you know, in those five states, I don't even qualify because of the fact that open heart surgery is an option. They don't consider me to be terminal. And so I don't have the option of even using um, assisted suicide, a doctor assisted suicide or anything in those five states, which is crazy. That there even needs to be more change than what has been made because these states need to rectify that situation. Well, Robert, you know, it's, I, I really appreciate you being part of the show. I've got to move along, but, uh, you know, you're always welcome to call here and talk to us about these issues. Uh, I do wish you the best of luck. And, and let me, but I got to ask you one last question. Have you sure. thought, have you thought about, you know, the process of actually when the time does come about, you know, what you're going to think about and where you're going to be and, 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 you know, your, your physical surroundings when that, you know, when the tunnel opens and the light at the end of the tunnel and all that stuff, I mean, have you given any of that any thought? Yes. And that's all has been changed. And just recently, because I thought that I was going to be dying here and basically had everything planned. But now I don't know where I'm going to be going or what I'm going to be doing. The whole situation has changed. Um, my landlord has increased my rent by 40 percent, and I don't see me staying here much longer. And this is where I had planned on, on going. So um, and short answer, no. Well, Robert, you know I'm on your team. You know we've got a place for you on Facebook, and you know you can always contact me, and we'll see what we can do to help you out. Robert, I really appreciate you you're gutting it out and sharing your story so publicly. You were on the front page of the New York Times. You are on Al Jazeera TV. I'm glad you're using your story to get the word out. You're a very important person to America, and I'm really glad you're part of our team. Thank you very much, Norm, for your time. Robert, I appreciate it. There you go. Robert Mitten. I pronounce it Mitten, but he's it's his it's his name. He gets to pronounce it any way he wants. It's M-I-T-T-O-N. Robert Mitton, right? Mitton, right, Robert? Yep. Mitton. Robert Mitton. And if you want to pitch in, if you want to help him out in his last days, however long or few they are, uh, you can go to our Facebook page, The Norman Goldman Show, because Robert can use a few dollars to pay his rent and to buy some food because his situation is much more typical of the people who are dying. Uh, they don't have any money on top of all the other problems they're confronted with. It's a scary, sad situation. 